UK's Labour Party lost the parliamentary seat of Hartlepool, a traditional stronghold for that party, as they look to appeal more to young, educated, and professional class voters versus their traditional working class base. According to one analysis of the loss, the Labour Party must radically change to appeal to the cultural and economic needs of hmm. working class people. So journalist and founder of Inquire More, Zed Jelani, joins us now to discuss the decline of the working class voters in the Labour Party. Zed, break down for us exactly what happened here, a lot being made over this election the trends that we're seeing across the pond and whether they even translate at all to here in the United States. Sure. So this was uh, basically what's called a by-election. It wasn't the uh, normal standing parliament's election. There was one resignation from the parliament, which was in Hartlepool, which is where you actually did have a parliamentary election. But otherwise, these were largely elections for councils, like local, their equivalents of local governments, mayors, et cetera, et cetera. And across the board, we saw not only did Labor lose its seat in Hartlepool, which was considered, you know, it's considered sort of a red wall region, meaning it's a region that the Labor Party has held for decades and decades. Um, it typically, it's their strong base. Not only did they lose that, but they lost heavily across council seats, not only uh, to the Tories, primarily the Conservatives, but also to sort of some minor parties, like the Green Party gained something like 80 seats. Uh, a number of other sort of smaller parties had success in, in different places, particularly in Scotland. Um, and, but there, you know, this in many ways was seen as a referendum on a post Jeremy Corbyn Labor Party, right? So Jeremy Corbyn was a left wing leader of the Labor Party, uh, he performed well in 2017, did not perform so well in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think many people have the theory that if we displace Corbyn, he's an incompetent far leftist, uh, now the Labor Party will start succeeding. Uh, but actually, if you looked at the polling going up into this election, the current leader, uh, Starmer, is basically just as, po as unpopular as Corbyn, um, although lar well, he's also largely unknown. Like he doesn't, he's not really inspiring people. He's not really right. uh, catching the imagination of the British voters. I mean, if you look at the polls, something like, I don't know, 46% or 40% of people have no opinion about him at all, but he d tends to have more unfavorables and favorables as well. Um, yeah, so it was, you know, it was an opportunity for sort of the post-Corbyn Labour Party to demonstrate its strength. Uh, and what you saw actually was they not only lose that historic parliamentary seat in the by-election, but also they lost uh, dozens and maybe even up to hundreds of, of seats in city council or, or in, in their equivalent of city councils across the country. So it was, in, in many ways, it was sort of the apex of 11 years of conservative rule in, in the United yes. Kingdom. The, the conservatives are just as powerful as ever. Um, and they don't seem to be in, under any threat from this composition of the Labour Party. And the, and the main takeaway, I think that that's a really good Substack post uh, from Alexia Aurora that you all featured. Uh, I encourage everyone to read it. The main takeaway is that they're basically losing people in the interior of the country, people mm -hmm. who are in uh, kind of the older communities, working class communities, less sort of transitional communities. Their their base now really is the cities, and even there they lost a little bit. I think Sadiq Khan, who was the mayor of London, actually did see a little bit of a drop in his vote share compared to where he was last time. So even there they lost a little bit of ground, although it's still their stronghold. Um, and, you know, it, it's a party composition that basically makes them unelectable in the United Kingdom. Were there to be another national parliamentary election, you would expect them to be destroyed under this composition. So, yeah. And um, do you see parallels to some of the struggles with the left in this country? Yeah. So that's a really interesting question. There is a uh, there's an economist who made a graphic which basically shows the share of college educated ratio to college educated to like working class voters in in every uh, political party uh, in the United States, United Kingdom and France. And in each of those three countries, you're seeing a trend, which is that the left of center parties are more dominated by people who went to college as opposed to people who are in a working class like social status. Right. They used to be working class parties. Now they're largely college educated parties. And that's just as true of the Democrats as it is of the Labour Party. Now, I don't think the Democrats are in as bad of a situation. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that uh, the conservatives in the UK are a little bit more clever at politics than the Republicans are in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'll give you one example. There was a poll recently by a group called More in Common. They surveyed people in the United Kingdom on what their most favorite institution was. Uh, above the monarchy, above BBC, above everything else was the NHS. You know, that was the most popular institution in the United Kingdom. The Tories have been very careful to never propose any kind of Americanization of the NHS, to not privatize the system. They basically protected it. They made small tweaks here and there. Uh, and also, I think during COVID-19, they enacted very strong social reforms. They, they spent a lot on social spending. They kept people employed. 
uh, in ways beyond what we did here in the United States. And I think that they understood that they can't be a far right party. You know, they can't just propose tax cuts. They can't just propose deregulation. I think they co-opted a lot of the workers that, that would traditionally vote for the Labor Party because even if they weren't as left-wing as the Labor Party, they were certainly culturally conservative and they were willing to accommodate on those economic issues. So I think that, you know, it's not entirely analogous to what happened in the United States because the, the conservatives in the UK, I think, are a more capable political party. Right. Uh, and, and I think also, look, our, our Democrats are a little bit more decentralized than the, the Labor Party is in the UK. I think that we have some regional variations in terms of how people are voting uh, to where the Democrats are just going to have a certain amount of strength in certain parts of the country just solely due to polarization and partisanship. Uh, and I think that's a, a little bit less in the UK. In the UK, they really have just been centered around really these metropolitan areas like London. Um, and mm -hmm. if you look at the maps, uh, the, the colors are reversed over there. So you see these big, huge blue areas and huge swaths of the country. That's that's where the conservatives control things now. And they, they basically do control everything outside the metropolitan areas and outside some of the weird regional situations like Scotland, uh, where they have smaller parties in the UK. Right. Ted, why is the conservative Labour Party, or the conservative party in the UK, so much more politically effective than the Republican Party here in the US? Look, I think we have a tradition of libertarianism in the United States that's very, very unique to the United States. Most conservative parties in the in the rest of the world, you know, they, they, they're generally, they do generally tend to be more right wing than the labor oriented parties or the left wing parties, for sure. They're, they're more in favor of capital, they're, they're less in favor of social spending. But I think they tend to moderate those views because they understand they're in cult, social and cultural context where people ac actively expect the government to do something in their interest. They expect the government to pr provide basic health care. They expect the government to have active labor market policy. They expect the government uh, to provide education for everybody. And I think here in the U.S., we have a very strong libertarian streak that exists within the Republican Party. Uh, and it's always been it's always been fairly unpopular, actually, if you pull it up to the general public. Um, but it's backed up very strongly by foundations, uh, by think tanks. There's a number of members of Congress who I think are very strident in this view, just regardless of whatever the public thinks. Um, and it's hard to displace. And I think in the in the United Kingdom, they have a different tradition. I mean, they're their main takeaway from World War II was that they needed to take care of their people in terms of health care, right? They built the NHS out of the ashes of World War II. I think that created a very strong political tradition in the United Kingdom that even the most conservative governments like Thatcher in the 80s uh, would say the NHS is, is safe in our hands. You know, they would not they would not undermine certain bedrock principles, I think, of, of uh, social democratic thought in the UK. And I think that, you know, Boris Johnson, there's another fact here we haven't discussed yet, which is the Brexit vote, right? The Brexit vote was sort of a populist vote uh, by the right. Lower income people were much more likely to support Brexit than upper income people. And I think Corbyn was caught in this trap the entire time and that he was very skeptical of the European Union himself. And he wanted to kind of go along with the Brexit vote. But there were many people in the Labour Party who wanted to push back and say that, hey, we need to have another referendum or we, we can't leave the European Union. They weren't respecting the vote, right? And I think a lot of the working, working class people who had voted for Brexit uh, ultimately ended up punishing labor for that, particularly now that they have a composition at the top, a leadership who was completely anti-Brexit. And I think Boris Johnson, not only did he embrace more social spending, not only is he a little bit more moderate than you would see conservatives here in the United States, but I think he really respected that Brexit. Um, he respected the vote and he respected the sentiment behind it, yes. which was very much driven by older people, working class people, traditional communities, um, and opposed by like the metropolitan areas, by, by the Londons of, of the United Kingdom. And you look, I think that in many ways, Boris Johnson is a very capable kind of populist, the kind of person I think a lot of conservatives wish Trump had been. Mm -hmm. um, he, he actually understands a lot of the underlying dynamics and he's, he's competent in terms of executing his strategy um, strategically. So I think that, you know, I think these dynamics do make the conservatives stronger in the UK than they would than the Republicans are in the United States. But there are some of the similar trends we do see regional polarization starting to happen in the United States, and we do see education polarization starting to happen in the United States. And I do think if the Republican Party were to establish a more competent and effective populace at the top, who was more careful, I think, in playing off those divisions, yeah, they, they could presumably put the Democrats in a similar position of, of being in, in such a political disadvantage. Right. Very interesting. Zed, thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Coming up, Professor Trita Parsi is going to discuss the possible return of the U.S. to the Iran nuclear deal when rising continues.